Good evening. Uh, I'm uh, Gilles Berashkar, uh, professor here at SOAS, and I will be uh, chairing this, uh, this, uh, this event. And uh, before introducing our speakers for, uh, for this evening and explaining how uh, uh, we will proceed, um, let me first uh, welcome you in the name of uh, one of the two sponsors of, uh, of this meeting, the London uh, Middle East uh, Institute, uh, of which I'm a member, but uh, the director would have uh, liked to, uh, to welcome you, but he, uh, he was not available this evening. So Dr. Hassan Hakimian uh, uh, asked me to welcome you in the name of the, uh, of the London Middle East Institute. And uh, uh, in the for, for, I mean, uh, to speak in the name of the uh, Center for Jewish Studies, the, the other sponsor of this event, we have the director here of the center, Dr. Yair Walach, who will, who will say a few words. Um, thank you very much, Professor Hoshka. Um, I'd like to uh, welcome uh, our speaker tonight, Professor uh, Shlomo Zend, and our discussant, uh, uh, Professor David Feldman, uh, neighbor from Birkbeck. Um, and to greet you all for coming. Thank you very much for coming and uh, happy Sukkot for those of you who celebrate it. Um, uh, it's a pleasure to see you all and also wanted to invite you to other uh, Center for Jewish Studies events. We have uh, weekly lectures on Wednesday evenings and our next big event is film screening of The Shadow of Baghdad, uh, a film about Iraqi Jews on the 20th of uh, November. I'll be very brief not to take any time for what is uh, promising to be a very uh, stimulating discussion. I'll just uh, say that, as you know, uh, Professor Zand's uh, previous two books stirred a very uh, heated debate, and I'm sure his uh, third one would do as well because it touches on uh, central and core issues of Jewish identity, past, present, and future, first and foremost in Israel and the Middle East, but also for Jews in uh, 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 Europe, UK, and elsewhere. And of course, these are very different contexts. Um, I think that as academics, intellectuals, I think our duty is to ask hard questions, sometimes provocative questions. And uh, I think that uh, Professor Zand has been doing it very successfully over the last a uh, few years, and if you agree with your arguments or if you disagree, I'm personally uh, uh, grateful for him for uh, making us uh, and pushing us uh, to think harder and to reflect deeper on these very significant issues. So I uh, leave uh, the stage for uh, the speakers. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> so, introducing our, our speakers, and it's my, my great pleasure to, uh, to uh, introduce one more time in this, uh, actually in the same room here, uh, uh, Professor uh, Shlomo Sand, uh, who uh, presented his uh, previous books, at least uh, two of, of his previous books uh, here at SOAS. So the, he's, uh, uh, he's here for, for the third time. With, uh, with this new book, but uh, just a few words, although I'm sure uh, uh, most of you, if not all of you, uh, know about, uh, about Professor Sand. He was uh, born in 1946 in a displaced persons camp in Austria to uh, Polish Jewish survivors of the Holocaust. And uh, the family later migrated to, uh, to Palestine. Uh, he studied history at the University of uh, Tel Aviv and uh, at the Ecole des Hautes Etudes en Sciences Sociales in Paris. And he currently teaches contemporary history at the University of, uh, of Tel Aviv. He is the author of, uh, of several books in Hebrew, in French, and some of them translated into English, uh, four of them actually translated into English, uh, Works and the Land, Israeli Intellectuals and the Nationalist Myth, the Invention of the Jewish People, which is the, the book who probably made uh, uh, or put uh, Professor Sand on the global intellectual map, 
uh, on the nation and the Jewish people, which is uh, at the same time a commentary on uh, Ernest Renan, and the invention of the land of, uh, of Israel. And this evening we are uh, uh, going to uh, listen to him introducing his uh, latest book. You have the title here and he was just telling us that uh, there is a m subtitle that, uh, that uh, 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 disappeared from the English translation, unfortunately, which is, uh, I'll say it, which is uh, an Israeli point of view. This is the original subtitle of, uh, of, uh, of the book. Uh, and, uh, uh, well, Professor uh, Sun will first, uh, uh, as I said, introduce his book, explain uh, what, uh, what he, he, he wanted to convey through, through this book. Uh, after him, uh, Professor uh, David uh, Feldman, who is the director of the Peers Institute uh, for the Study of Antisemitism, uh, here at our, our neighboring institution of Birkbeck uh, will uh, uh, discuss or comment uh, on, uh, on the book and maybe also on, uh, on uh, what uh, Shlomo Sand will be, will be saying. And of course, normally and naturally, we'll, uh, we'll ask uh, uh, Shlomo Sand to, to, uh, to comment on the comment, after which we will open the discussion uh, for for you and for the audience, you would be able to uh, put your questions, remarks, uh, and the rest. So that's how we will proceed. And um, uh, please join me then in welcoming our, our speakers for tonight. Thank you very much. For coming, thank you to invite me to this university. It's the third time I think that uh, I speak before you, and I start to feel a little bit like in Tel Aviv. The only problem that I am obliged to speak in English, and I prefer to speak in Hebrew, but I believe that it's not possible. No, <laughs> even that I see a few Israelis here. Anyway, I'm not used, you know, a day before yesterday I arrived to London and I'm not used to, to speak freely English. Then excuse me for all the faults that I'm going to, to pronounce in English, okay? I will try to be clear, even I will make a lot of mistakes. Uh, this is the third one of a, a kind of a serial trilogy of books that I wrote about Zionism, Israel, and Judaism. Now, this book is a very short one because people blame me that I'm writing too much in the first two books. Too long, a lot of footnotes, you see? And not easy to read. And then I decided to write something else without footnotes. It's very difficult for a historian that is afraid from every word that he's writing to write without footnotes. You see? It's not so easy. Then I decide to write without footnotes about a subject that is a kind of conclusion of my two first book about Judaism, Zionism, and Israel. This book is personal, yeah? And the title, as you heard, is How I Stopped to Be a Jew. The question, the first question is, did I was a Jew before? No. From cultural point of view, I don't believe that the secular Judaism exists. Secular Judaism as identity exists because people define themselves, secular people, atheists, define themselves as Jews. It's not a problem. Jewish secular identity exists. The question is if culturally secular Jewishness exists. And I don't believe. It's a long time that I was thinking about it. But I never thought that I will, be I will go to publish a book, How I Stopped to Be, to be a Jew. The, the first time that I started to think about the subject was by reading again an essay of Bertrand Russell. He wrote it in the 20s. Why I'm not a Christian. 
Do you know it? Very famous one. No. You stop to read Bertrand Russell. A very clever essay, Why I Am Not a Christian. In the beginning, the name of the book was Why I Am Not a Jew. But I developed it. I changed it a lot. But the idea, the first idea, came from Bertrand Russell. If he is not a Christian, I am not a Jew. Now, there is a few other reasons that I decided to write this book. And also, it has a relationship with England and with London. I think it was three years ago. I was speaking here in a bookshop. I don't remember the name of the bookshop. A very nice place. I was speaking about my second book, uh, The Invention of the Land of Israel. And it was uh, with Brian Clark. The name of the moderator was Brian Clark, a very nice person from Oxford, I think. And we developed a discussion about uh, Jewish people, and he said that he has agreed with me with all my critic about Zionism, but he is a very, very Jew. And, uh, and I say that I don't understand in which way he is a Jew. We started to, to develop the idea. He said that he is a Jew, he feels a Jew, and I asked him which kind of culture, Jewish culture, because he is a secular one, which kind of Jewish culture he is going to transmit to his children. And he said that his children is not his children, it's the wife children, which is from Christian origin. Then he don't have a problem of transmitting. <laughs> Everything was very nice, very lovely. And the audience started to discuss. Oh, and you remember uh, the evening? They discussed. Uh, most of the audience were from Jewish origin, good uh, Englishmen. And I see in the corner a group, three or four non-Jew, I mean from the Middle East, that didn't take a part in the discussion. And I feel very badly about them. And I remember going out from this bookshop and asking myself one question that I never asked before. How somebody that is not born to a Jewish mother can join the club. I mean, you can become a socialist, you can become a labor member, especially after yesterday evening. <laughs> and uh, you can become British even, yeah, with a lot of difficulties. You can become an Israeli. You can become Muslims very easily. And you can become a Jewish Orthodox believer. In which way somebody can become a secular Jew without having a mother that is Jewish? And then suddenly I say, no, it's an exclusive club, a closed club, no? Nobody can join the Jewish secular identity. It's true or not? When I expose it in Tel Aviv, somebody says, he can convert it to Judaism and after it to jump away. No, really, really. A lot of people say, but it is exclusive club. You cannot join the club. 50 years ago, 100 years ago, 200 years ago, nobody wants to join the club. It's true. Today, today, it's become more trendy, more easy no? to be a Jew in the Western world. And I felt bad this evening about this, uh, the people that were there, they didn't take a part in the discussion about Jewish identity. This is another reason to write the book. There is a lot of others. Why I don't feel today, like all my life, that I have the right or the obligation to define myself as a Jew? Culturally, as a historian, I know that a secular Judaism does, doesn't exist. There is question if a Jewish sensibility exists and what is the meaning of a Jewish sensibility that exists. But one thing I'm sure, if there is a Israeli culture, language, food, music, music etc., you cannot find a Jewish secular culture that, you know, the Jewish has in the world. Not food, not music. People mix between 
Yiddish culture, and it was a very, very important culture in the past. It was destroyed by a lot of forces, Nazism, Bolshevism, Zionism, etc. But it was, in East Europe, a very, very important Yiddish culture, an Yiddish identity, in Yiddish political parties, etc., etc. But if there is an Israeli culture, if there is an Yiddish culture, I don't understand what is a secular Jewish culture. But all this is not a reason to write a book about, about it, no? The second, you know, every important thing has a lot of reasons. You start to understand history by understanding it before. There is other reasons that I felt very badly to define myself as a Jew. You see, I'm living in the Israeli state. I'm living in Tel Aviv most of my life. After the, the displacement camp, I was living in Tel Aviv. Now, Israel defines itself as a Jewish state. Agree with me, yeah? Not only Bibi Netanyahu, not only Abigdor Lieberman, also the Labour Party. You know, in Israel, insist. And not only the Labour Party, even Meretz, it's another political left party, define Israel as a Jewish state. Now, I'm living in a state, a Jewish state, that a quarter of the population are not defined as Jews by the Minister of Interior. You know it. 20% of Arab Israelis. I'm not speaking about the occupied territories. I'm speaking about citizens in the state of Israel. And 5% of emigrant, descendants of emigrants from East Europe that were not with Jewish mothers. Together, 25% of the population in Israel without the occupied, uh, occupied territories are not considered as Jews. How come that Israel defines itself as a Jewish state? In most of the Jews in the world, accept it. In most of the establishment communities in the world, Jewish one, not only accept it, are very, very happy with it. Imagine to the, tomorrow that in, uh, Britain decides to define itself as an English state, or Christian English state, it's much better. How long it will exist, your kingdom? Big Britain, Great Britain, how long? If it's defined itself, not a state, a kingdom of all the British, but only of the English one. How the Scot will feel? How the Welsh will feel? How the children of emigrants that they become British citizens will feel? They will feel like Arab Israelis are feeling in, in Israel. I mean, they are living, walking, dying in a state that considers itself the state of Woody Allen and not of them. Why? I'm sure that there are people here, even on, on the stage, that consider themselves as Jews. If you want or you want one, it's your state. Yes, it's your state, Professor Feldman. <laughs> it's not the state of my pupils, Palestinian Israelis pupils. I have Palestinian Israeli pupils in Tel Aviv University. Then I ask you, seriously, defining myself as Jew, continue to be a Jew in Israel today, it's unmoral. Because a Jew in the state of Israel is a privileged citizen. True or not true? Somebody contested, and I don't speak of the occupied territories. 37 years, a population without any political civic rights. Not 47 days, not 47 weeks, not 47 months. 47 years. In the Western world, are thinking we, we need a peace process. In the Labour Members Party in Israel, asked the members 
of the Labour Party in, in Britain not to vote to recognize the Palestinian state. Wait to the peace process, 47 years. They hope that it will be again 47 years. No, but you know, a few years ago when I started to, to walk about the history of the Jewish, I was sure that the ter territorial problem will finish very quickly. Rationality, because I tried to be a rational person, I understood that, you know, Israel will decide very quickly to stop the occupation because uh, she wants to stay a Jewish state. I make a mistake, by the way. If you want, I will develop it later because I promise to speak only 30, maximum 30 minutes. Then I will continue to, to speak about Jewish identity and not about the political problem of Israel today, okay? Going back, I decided to write this book declaring that I'm not a Jew because I'm ashamed to be a Jew in Israel, first of all because I am a privileged citizen, as I said before. And if Britain will declare that it's an English state, the Englishmen that will insist that they are English will not be moral in my point of view. I compare it also with other states. You see, if, the Spain, if the Spain will declare tomorrow that is not a state of all the Spanish, but only of the Castilian. The Catalan will not take it, uh, you know, very nicely. In the Basque, in the Andalusian also. But Israel is a state, or a communitary state, you understand? Not a republic. Not a state of its citizens. It's not looking the good of its citizens that are paying the taxes. It's looking of the good of the Jewish in London, hoping that one day they will arrive. This is another reason that I wrote this book. I can continue with all other reasons, thinking that all my life, when I define myself as a Jew, it was firstly because anti-Semitism. I remember repeating as a leftist militant always, that I am a Jew till the last anti-Semitic person will live with us, with us in this planet. And I repeat it and repeat it for a long of years, and I become old with this idea. And then I decide it's not enough to define something in this way. Because if I will define myself as a Jew because of anti-Semitism, in some way, I will give them a kind of victory. If I define myself as a Jew because of the past, because of the memory, in some way, the Nazis won. Why? Because they considered the Jews as an essentialist figure in history, an essentialist identity. Essentialist, I'm saying, Jewishness for the Nazis, like for the anti-Semitic racist, was his essentialist identity, okay? Then if I consider myself as a Jew, secular Jew, there is some essentialism in my definition. And I don't feel very comfortable about it. And I don't like that the Nazis won. They lost the battle and they won the ideal from the point of view of ideologically. People ask me, no, a Jew, stay a Jew forever. Then it's a victory of anti-Semitism. Now I decided that I don't want that the anti-Semitic will win. It's finished. And I decided that I am not a Jew. What was the reaction about it? Terrible. People are feeling, ah, how come? But a day before yesterday, I took the plane from Tel Aviv to London. And I start to speak with a young woman uh, about our travel to London. 
she said she's going to, to meet a guy that she knows that she's engaged. I say, whoa, fantastic, fantastic. You quote an Englishman. She said, yes, yes, but he's a Jew. <laughs> then I say, oh, I don't care. Why you don't care? Oh, if he was from Christian origin, it's the same thing. It's nice that you quote an Englishman. I ask her if he's blonde because she was with very dark hairs. I ask her from where you come, and she say from Tashkent, 20 years in Israel, Haifa. Tashkent. The look was a real Tatarian, by the way. I mean, a very nice woman, very lovely woman, but with, you know, what is Tatarian, you know, a little Mongol. Me too, have a little bit of it. Anyway, she's 20 years in Israel. And then I say, oh, it's fantastic. I was happy for her. And she say, he's a Jew. I say, I don't care if he's a Jew or not a Jew. He's a good man? Yes. But you have to understand it's important that he is a Jew. I ask, why? You are not religious. By the way, all around us, it was Hasidic people. <laughs> and she was with jeans like this, very sexy. <laughs> and I ask her, why it's so important for her that he's a Jew? Because of the blood, she said. Because of the blood. Which blood? Jewish blood. OK. She is not a scientific person. She is not an intellectual. But I'm working in Tel Aviv University, where you can find departments that people, professors, scientific people, are looking for the Jewish DNA. Do you know it? After publishing the first book, I was attacked. I remember an article about me in the New York Times, a very nice article. And uh, in the end of the article, Patricia Cohen, by the way, I don't know, a journalist, she was not aggressive against me. But in the end, she called a genetician in New York. And they say, no, no, Shlomo Sand is not right, because there is a DNA, a Jewish DNA. It's not a joke. The problem is with the Jewish identity today, secular Jewish identity, that it's too weak to be a real identity. How a secular Jew can define himself? By blood, like this young woman, no? There is a common DNA for the Jewish in the world or not? Look on the Jews, huh? The anti-Semitic were right saying that it is a kind of people race. It's not a joke. In my university, people are looking without a lot of success for Jewish DNA because it's so difficult to define a secular Jew. What is the other way to define a secular Jew? It's by the Shoah, no? You cannot stop to be a Jew because of the Shoah. I heard it a lot of times. Then, Defining somebody only around the memory, in the memory of a tragedy, can become very perverse. Perversive? Perver. Perverse. To define somebody's identity only after a memory of a tragedy can be very perverse. And this is one of the acts of Jewish secular identity in our world in the beginning of the 21st century. True or not true? While it can be perversive, because look on the education today in Israel. People are Jew because of the Shoah. The third way to define yourself as a Jew is to identify with Israel. It's one of the means to define yourself as a Jew. In the Israeli policy, the last 50 years are playing with this a lot. To be a Jew is to identify with Israel, to identify with the Jewish state. You will say, but it's not rational. You can become a Jew, to be a Jew and anti-Zionist. But in the end, in the end of the story, who won 
in this identical politics today. How Israel forced people that define themselves as Jew and feel very, very difficult to define themselves as Jew? What, what Israel imposed on them? You have to identify with the Jewish state. In Israel is, is gaining a lot with this policy. Then I decided that I don't belong to the same identity of a Victor Lieberman. He want me to stay a Jew. Bibi Netanyahu want me to live in the Jewish state. I decided to resign. And I don't care what people will think about me. Thank you very much. Okay. Well, thank you, Shlomo, for the book and for your talk this evening. Thank you, Gilbert, for the invitation to speak. One of the pleasures of opening Shlomo's book was to see the dedication to um, Eric Hobsbawm there. Um, it was my a, a privilege to work uh, with Eric um, at Birkbeck, um, where he, be he was a historian, then became president of the college, and I, um, um, I ran one of the last uh, research projects for him when he was awarded the Balzan Prize. I mention that because I think one of the things um, Shlomo and I and Eric share is a sort of a skepticism, a common skepticism in the face of the claims made by nationalisms of all sorts. And so I think that although some of what I say um, um, is going to be critical, I think it's important to keep in mind uh, that sort of common starting point and a common project. Shlomo's book is short, which is one of its many merits. <laughs> it's not war and peace. It's also, and this is actually worth saying, I think it has been brilliantly translated by a David Fernbach. It's packed with insights and provocations and autobiographical vignettes. It's written in a spirit of impassioned pessimism. And what I want to say about it will come like uh, the Holy Trinity in three parts. Um, I want to talk about Israel and um, Shlomo's Republican vision. Secondly, I want to ask why Shlomo causes so much ruckus with his work. And then I want to talk about Shlomo's view of Jewish history and of Jewish identity and of, of Jewish secular identity in the <coughs> diaspora. Reading Shlomo's book, just on that point, is, reading Shlomo's book, I, I realized that it is not only Israelis who support the current government who have contempt for Jewish secular diaspora culture. It's also, I think I got that flavor from Shlomo's remarks. Well, how I stopped being a Jew, as Ashlam explained, is not only a call for Israel to free itself from the occupation, but it's also, and this is what is more rare, it connects that to the structural inequality of Jews and Arabs within Israel. The political argument at the core of the book concerns the configuration of nationality and citizenship in Israel. And as we've been told, 20% of the population of Israel is Arab. They live in a state which designates itself as the state of the Jews. Moreover, this difference in nationality has in practice and despite rights as individuals consigned Arabs in Israel to a structure of discrimination in part as a, as a result of legally sanctioned disadvantage, in part as a way in which resources are distributed. It's probably 
worth just for a moment dwelling on some of the facts and figures here to get a sense of the dimensions of the injustice. If we look at, at poverty, for example, 50% of Arab families in Israel, this is in Israel behind the 67 boundaries, live in poverty, whereas the equivalent figure for Jewish families is just 15%. And a huge contributory factor here, of course, is the discriminatory and neglectful policies of the state over land, over planning, over rural and urban development, over housing provision. In 1948, Jews controlled 13.5% of the land. By the 1960s, this had risen to 93%. According to the Israeli scholar Oren Yiftachel, 50 to 60% of Arab-held land was expropriated by the state. Then there's the issue of unequal funding to Arab municipalities. Perhaps it's not surprising that in 2012, 67% of Israeli Arabs believe that Israel is a racist state. Shlomo pays attention to this and, it is, and that he draws our attention to it, um, and it's important that he does. His answer to the problem is a Republican one. Nationality and citizenship, he proposes, should become one and the same. not to have Israeli citizens with a Jewish nationality, but, Isra but Israeli citizens with an Israeli nationality which is open to all inhabitants. It's an inspiring vision. It was an inspiring vision in France in 1789, which I'm sure is where Shlomo derives it from. I think it's no coincidence that the book was indeed written in French. The suggestion Shomu's focus on citizenship and nationality is important because I think it helps us to, to think about um, Israel and Palestine and, and the state of Israel itself in terms other than a primordial conflict of identities between Jew and Palestinian, but in terms of a more general problem which takes a particular and acute form in Israel of how citizenship can take account of more than one nationality within the territory of a given state. Although Shlomo had some fun asking what would it be if, if England, he said, well, let's say that the United Kingdom belonged to England, and not to the Scots or the Welsh or the Irish. Well, actually, there are a lot of people who think that it does just that. And Scotland has just had a referendum based upon that premise, in a way, about English hegemony here. None of, which is not, of course, to say, well, Israel is just like the UK, but it is a particular, and as I say, a particularly acute manifestation of a general problem. In that case, a product of settlement, colonialism, war, displacement, migration, and more war. What is needed in Israel, among other things, as the Orr Commission in the early 2000s said, is a massive program of affirmative action. It's not clear to me that in the face of such structural inequality in Israel and the need to redress that, and in the increasing identification of the Arab population in Israel with Palestinian nationality, that a Republican citizenship is going to do the trick. After all, nationalities and identities are maintained in part for instrumental reasons. For Israeli Arabs or Pal Israeli Palestinians, maintaining that identity, demanding and claiming rights on that basis may prove a more attractive program than Shlomo's Republican uninflected identity. There is, I think, a need to recognize the Palestinians as a national minority in Israel with collective as well as individual rights. And without this, republicanism will just entrench a brutal majoritarianism. In going for 
republicanism, I think Shlomo implicitly, he seems to reject the possibility of a pluralist and, if you like, a multicultural politics in Israel. And he does the same for Jews outside of Israel as well. But before coming to that question, I want to ask a different one, which is, why do people get so upset by what Shlomo has to say? Is it because of his radical and anti-Zionist position? Well, to a degree, that's so. He's standing outside of the consensus. But actually, that position is not so unusual. There are others who occupy it and don't necessarily express it in the same way, who don't attract the same vehement opposition. Is it because he's accused by other scholars of sometimes getting things wrong? Well, historians can be robust. They can um, respond to an erring colleague as if he were an Amalekite who should be slain hip and thigh. But all the same, I don't think that is the answer. And it's not the answer to why at times I felt a degree of unease reading some passages in how I stopped being a Jew. Shlomo rails against those who, he says, regard Jewishness as an immutable and monolithic essence. Judaism, he says, has fashioned a strongly particularist ethno-religious morality. He, he reminds us of the stories of biblical genocide, of parts of the Haggadah, which um, call on God to um, pour out his wrath on the Goyim, and rightly points out that love thy neighbor as thyself was out in, that, in that passage from Leviticus, um, who our neighbor was, was actually cast rather narrowly. It was not humanity in general. All of this is correct, but simply to characterize Judaism in these terms, and I say this as someone who is <coughs> utterly secular, who has not even got a smidgen of God-fearing decency in him, um, to present Judaism in, in these terms is a misleading caricature. It is cherry-picking, but it is picking only the rotten, maggot-ridden, infested cherries. The Hebrew prophets, bizarrely, are, are, are thrown away by Shlomo. They're really Christian, he says. And the reworking of Judaism in the 19th century, is, in the, actually in the 18th, 19th, and 20th centuries, is, ignore, is ignored by him. In that period, even among the Orthodox, and, and, and I'll, I'll be brief here, even among the Orthodox, Judaism was sort of understood then as a religion in, in two parts. One part of it, they said, was universal. It was an ethical monotheism for everyone. And there was another bit for the Jews. Now, it clearly is the case that, if I, if I get his phrase correctly, um, a strongly particularist ethno religious morality can be used in Israel, drawing on Jewish teachings to justify policies and actions in the present. But to present this as the sum of Judaism, even of Orthodox Judaism, I think is, is partial. But what is really troubling to me is that in its partiality, it reproduces exactly the criticisms made of Jews in Judaism by 19th century Judeophobes and anti-Semites to assert that Jews could not be given equal rights, that it was used to justify the Jews' unequal disadvantaged status as citizens in Europe. Moreover, whether unintentionally perhaps, I think this line of argument promotes the idea that the problems of it in Israel lie in Jewishness and in Jewish teachings. It gives comfort to those who want to give an essentialist, misleading, and anti-Semitic account of the conflict between Israel and the Palestinians. And indeed, it threatens to undo the good work Shlomo has done by directing us to focus on citizenship and nationality. Now, lastly, I want to turn to his comments on identity and the Jews. 
Shlomo issues a rallying call for a single Israeli citizenship, and much else in his book follows from this. He and other Jews must cease to have a nationality which is separate from their citizenship. And by the same token, Israel is then off limits for Jews elsewhere in the world. Israel has a Republican Israeli citizenship. It's no longer the state of the Jews. The D Jewish diaspora no longer has a claim to intervene or speak to Israel on the basis of ethnic affiliation. This, as I take it, is Shlomo's argument. The silencing of me and my friends, of Israel's Jewish critics, is for th in this collateral damage. You know, we're a sad accident, but we too have to belt up if the program is to go forward. Well, Shlomo claims that secular Jewish identity outside of Israel is based, is based on, or, or, on an identification with dissent. That's not the good dissent, D-I-S-S-E-N-T, -S -S but the bad dissent, D-E-S-C-E-N-T. There is no way of life, no culture, as he's told us, held in common by secular Jews. It is empty in contrast to the way of life, to the culture offered by religious Judaism. It is based simply on the idea of common descent from the seed of Abraham, and it is hollow. And he has much fun with what he rightly calls pseudo-religious practices. And he also rightly says that the main expression of the Jewish diaspora is in its identification with Israel, and that in general the diaspora mobilizes support for Israel and its policies. So what's wrong with this? Well, I think first of all, historically, there's a massive gap in the account that Shlomo gives us. He goes from Jew Jewishness as a culture in what he calls the Yiddish people, for example. So Jewishness encompasses um, a religion and a way of life to nationality in Israel. What's missed out? What's missed out is the history of Jewish emancipation, of Jewish civil equality in Western and Central Europe. In, and actually in either ignoring or denigrating the history of emancipation in, a, in an ironic way, uh, Shlomo affiliates himself with the main tendencies, indeed, of Jewish nationalist historiography. Why is this important? It's, it's important because as Jews acquired civic equality, Jewishness, Jewish identity, ceased to become a culture in the terms that Shlomo has defined it, a way of, an all-encompassing way of life. It became one identity that Jews had among many. They were also patriots. They were also class subjects. They followed their professions. They had an associational life in civil society. Jewish identity thinned out, but it did not disappear. Why didn't it disappear? Well, in part because Jews were still recognized by non-Jews as Jews with particular traits, either positive or often negative, but also not because of a myth of dissent, although that was there for some, but because of history and culture and the ways in which at different times Jews felt that their history bore upon their present. And for Shlomo to say that there is no Jewish, secular Jewish culture is simply not the case. It's wrong for the 19th, 20th centuries, and it's wrong for the present as well. It is true to say that interaction with Israel forms a part of that culture, but it's only a part of that culture. And I think that one of the reasons why across Western Europe and to an extent in the United States, a secular Jewish culture is undergoing an increase in liveliness is actually a Jewish response to the politics of multiculturalism. It's actually an environment in which for some people this offers an opportunity. Now I think part of the disagreement between Shlomo and me here is actually over the use of the term culture. 
And Shlomo earlier said in, a, in an important and revealing way that he's using culture in an anthropological sense. And to that extent, I agree with him. There is no secular Jew Jewish way of life. But if we think of culture as a set of signifying practices and identities, then there is a secular Jewish culture in Europe. The Ar Aryan identity is also a culture, okay? The Aryan identity in the 30s is also was a culture, yeah? Let him finish. Sorry. <laughs> the Aryan identity. So, beyond that, I, I'm sorry, I'll just... I'm sorry that I just... Uh, it's okay, I, I'll... Um, so, I actually do want to say something about um, identity again, because I think that to say I will simply stop being a Jew, to exit as an act of unilateral, as an act of unilateral disaffiliation is to misunderstand the way in which identities work in society. We are less in control of our destinies than that. Identity is relational. We are not in control or not the only ones in control. Others name us, others position us, and we have to respond in one way or another. Sometimes for some of us as Jews, identity is imposed from without as well as constructed from within. It is dynamic. Shlomo may seek to exit from the Jewish fold, but the furore that his work arise, uh, uh, gives rise to arises directly from the fact that he is or was a Jew. And as for Israel's Jewish critics, whom Shlomo would be prepared to silence as a price worth paying, I have to say that he will find most of us uncooperative, that silence is not an option because Jews in the diaspora continually are interpolated in the debate on Israel and Palestine by others, by those in Israel and outside who speak in our name or call on us to support Israel as Jews or in some cases to speak out in criticism. I'll, I'll draw to the, a close. I want to welcome Shlomo's book. Provocation is good, but as, as history I have my, difference with it, uh, my differences with it and as... And as politics, I believe it is self-defeating. I think he, he rejects potential allies, both in Israel, among Jews and Arabs there, and in the diaspora. As autobiography, it is a very entertaining and interesting read. But what about Shlomo's aspirations to stop being a Jew? It reminds, his aspiration here reminds me of some wise words that were once said to me, which was, David, you can divorce your wife, but you can't divorce your ex-wife. Shlomo <laughs> is trying to divorce his ex-wife. Thank you. Sorry again that I disturb you. <laughs> and thanks a lot that you accept to confront me. You know, it's not so easy for uh, English Jews to confront Shlomo Sand. Thank you very much. Now, what is the problem with your definitions about nationalism, ethnicity, identity? You expose me as a Jacobin, Republican French Jacobin. No, I'm not. It's years that I'm against Jacobin republicanism, and I don't want that Israel will become a, a kind of a Jacobin Republic. Not at all. I am not a Canaanian, 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 you say? You know, it was a current, a cultural current in the beginning of the 50s, the end of the 40s. No. But saying that even Britain, you know, has problems of identity. I know it. I read papers. I am looking at the TV. I know what the Scots, a part of the Scots, is thinking. But I don't like this way not to define exactly identical politics in a nation, in a state nation. Britain is different from France. In a good way, in a bad way. In the good way that she kept much more pluralistic 
local culture than France. And I'm much more English liberal than French Republican in this identity politics. I don't want to make the Israeli Arabs Israelis, pure Israelis. I want that they will keep, besides their culture, and have also my culture. I think in the end of the book, I'm saying that every Arab Israeli child has to learn very, very carefully Hebrew. But every Jew Israeli has to learn Arabic. Not only because he's living in a state with so many Arabs, also because he's living in the Middle East. Then sorry to interpret me badly. Now, what is the difference between Great Britain and Little Israel? Britain is not saying to the Scot, it's not your kingdom. And you know, from sensibility, from identical politics, it's very important to be a little bit hypoc hypocrite. Israel is not hypocrite. She said to the Arabs, it's not your state. Try do it in London saying to the Scot, it's not your state. It's not the same thing. But I don't want to, to speak a lot about it. I will give one example. Yes, I know what is English hegemony in the United Kingdom. I have not illusions. But it's not the same thing as the Israeli Jewish hegemony in Israel. Then I am not a Jacobin, sorry. I'll give you one example. Tell me, an Englishman from, Jew, uh, from Christian origin can marry a nice girl from Jewish origin or not? Yes, but in Israel, no. And who fixed the laws that a Jew cannot marry a non-Jew in Israel? Religious people? Not at all. Before the establishment of the state in 48, in 47, Ben Gurion, the founder of the state, signed that in Israel it will not be civic marriages. In that time, the religious Orthodox were very, very weak. It wasn't a problem, electoral problem. It was because Ben Gurion was afraid, very afraid the Jewish will become mixed with non-Jewish, like in England, like in the United States, like in France. Stop the marriages. Save the Jewish people by for, not let people marry with non-Jew. It's the only people in the world that you can save it if the, the person will not marry non-Jews. True or not true? Think about identity. If a Jewish person fall in love with the non-Jews. What will happen with the Jewish sensibility, with the Jewish identity, with the pluralistic identity? It will disappear in one, two, three generations. Sorry? Now you blame me in some way, a very nice way, but you blame me that a lot of argument is the argument of the anti-Semitic of the 19th century. Not at all because I'm not a Jacobin. I'm not against Jewish identity in one condition. The Jewishness will be the point of departure, not the point of arrival. First of all, because it's empty. Secondly, because I am an universalist. Yes, you cannot divorce an ex-wife. But you can forget it. <laughs> now, yeah, by the way, I put a lot of, uh, of uh, episode, jokes, anecdote in my book. It's much better than two others' book. But what is important in this book? You see, in the book that I wrote about the invention of the land of Israel, I was very careful not to identify Jewishness with Zionism. Because for me, 
historically, Zionism is a kind of denial of Judaism. It's clear in the second book about the land of Israel. As you know, Judaism, all the establishment, religious establishment of Judaism, till the Second World War, were in majority against Zionism. For a Jew, the land, the Holy Land, wasn't his land. It was the land of God. God gave. God took, and when the Messiah will come, he will give back maybe. Then a Jew couldn't feel that he is the property of the land of the Holy Land. I insist in the book that Jewishness is not Zionism. Jewishness is not nationalism. But it doesn't mean that I like very much the Jewish religion. Anyway, I am against all monotheism. even the Muslim. But it's very important to understand that Zionism picked up a lot of things from the Jewish tradition. Zionism in Israel is not a Jewish state. But they picked up, like always the nationalists doing, what they like from the past. They constructed the past. Now, in this book, the first time I insist that even that Zionism is not Judaism, it doesn't mean that Judaism is a very, very ethical religion. It's very important to understand it. For Judaism, a Jew cannot marry the non-Jew. Do you know it? Oh, I'm against it. I'm for love. I don't care if my daughter will marry the non-Jew. Maybe you, yes, not me. <laughs> or ex-daughter. <laughs> again, again, again. It's very important. You have to understand. Jewish ethics, in my point of view, are not the ethics that I dream of. Why? Because in Jewishness, the ethics is intergroup. You say it in English, intergroup? It's not universalist ethics, you have to understand, much less than Muslims or Christianity. Why? Not only because of the Bible, because it was a, a minority that suffered from strong power around it. They developed an intergroup ethics. You cannot find rabbis that fought today in England, in France, for the suffering, against the suffering of the Palestinians. Orthodox rabbis? Not. You can find Orthodox rabbis fighting against the Zionism, the Zionist state. Not because the solidarity of the with the Palestinians. Not at all. You understand me? They are a lot of orthodox rabbis that are fighting against Zionism. But you don't have, in the Jewish ethics, you don't have a cosmopolitism ethics, universal ethics. The fact that so many Jews, and I insist in the book, in the 19th century and also in the 20th century, so many people from Jewish origin fought in all the battles for the human being, all the battles against suffering. It wasn't because the Jewish ethics. They were humanist if they were far away from the Jewish religion, from Marx, passing Rosa Luxemburg till Deutsche, or Howard Zinn. But all these generation of people from Jewish origin, Jewish background, like me, by the way, fought for universal causes, not because they were Jews, that because they left Jewishness. The people that stay with the Jewish religion didn't fought for causes, universal causes. Do you know it? And by the way, in the beginning of the 21st century, there are less and less 
people from Jewish origin that fought for universal causes. You notice it? Why? Because the reason that so many people from Jewish origin fought against injustice, against suffering, because they came from a suffering minority, a suffering long years minority that suffered from Christian civilization, much more than from the Muslims. <laughs> you know, lately, in Paris, in London, in New York, people are speaking about the Judo Christianity. You heard about it? Civilization. Judo Christianity civilization. People like the term. In the first book I wrote that my aunt, my aunt didn't know when they pushed her to Auschwitz that one day Europe, the Western world, will define itself as a Judo-Christian civilization. It's nice, no? There is not a Jewish Christian, uh, Christian civilization. There is a Christian civilization that oppressed the Jewishness much more than all other civilizations in history. This is the truth. And this minority became a very tough minority, believing that a chosen people, it was one of the conditions, sine qua non, to stay a Jew, to know that you are a chosen people. And it was all right for my, me. But today, to meet people that define themselves as Jews, knowing that Jew is a sheik, it's trendy today, huh? They're exceptional in the Western world. And also, deeply, it disgusts me, people that try to make profit of suffering capital of the past. Making symbolic capital of suffering of the past disgusts me profoundly. And this is one of the acts in Jewish identity in the Western world today. No? No? Not only Bibi Netanyahu is doing it. Not only Bibi Netanyahu insists that Israel has to have a nuclear weapon, and nobody else in the Middle East. Why? Why the Iran cannot have a weapon, a nuclear weapon? Because it's a small state in face of the great state of Israel. I don't want that Iran will have a nuclear weapon. But all this discussion, international discussion, I ask myself, how come? How it's natural that Israel will have in great nuclear submarine from Germany lately, you know, when Iran cannot develop a nuclear weapon? How come? This is a Jewish identity. Besides a lot of other things. No, it's very important. I am not against Jewish identity. In one condition, that in this identity, you didn't try to separate yourself from other people, not to mix with other people, not you, to want that your descendant people will become, stay Jewish, and not to live with others. Now, you spoke that the world is composed of identities. I have a little chapter in the book that identity is not a hat. Hat, yeah? You can have a lot of identities. I am rich with identities. I will not expose all of them here. <laughs> yes, I'm an Israeli. I'm a professor of history. I'm a lot of other folks. And it's important. Everybody has a lot of identities. In, histo in history, two kinds of identities were ex exclusive identities. It was monotheism, and it was modern nationalism. You cannot be English and French at the same time. Till lately, you know, when the nationalism started to, to you know, you cannot be German and French at the same time. This is the essence of modern identity that we call nationalism. But there is other identities 
that can live with other identities. But you cannot be a Jew and a Muslim at the same time. It's true or not? You cannot be a Christian and a Muslim in the same time. I'm against this exclusive identity of any sort. And for the end, because I don't want to be too long, I'm very curious what you are thinking about all this problem. But one thing important about empty identity. You see, as a historian, I know, I studied the Aryan identity. You will agree that the Aryan identity exists, existed in the past. You agree with it or not? In the 30s, no? Oh, in the 30s, a lot of Germans believed that they are from Aryan race. It was an identity. Ah, you agree that it wasn't a real race, a real blood. But the identity existed. If people identify themselves as Aryan, the Aryan identity exists. I don't respect this identity. You know why? Not only because it was based of mythology. Not only because this identity was exclusive identity that considered people in a sensualist way. But it existed. A lot of German, even Englishmen in that time, considered themselves as Aryan. I ask you, how we have to accept this kind of identity, exclusive identity? By the way, I don't think the Jewishness is the same thing like the Aryanism. Not at all. I don't compare. Because, first of all, from the ideological point of view, it's not the same. Even if in Judaism day you have a base of racist thinking. But what's important that the Aryan identity, if you want, was the identity that not only with Jews, but with Slavs and all others, took them, all other identities, as inferior identities. You agree with it? The Jewish identity is very, very specific. But one thing you can compare. The Aryan identity was a weak identity. This is one of the reasons of the aggressivity of this identity. You understand me? It was empty. From cultural point of view, it was empty. There is not Aryan culture in history. They tried to build it a little bit with Wagner and others. But you cannot speak about Aryan culture. You can speak about German culture, about Yiddish culture, about Israeli culture, about English culture even Scott culture, a little bit. <laughs> but secular Jewish culture, no, it's identity, I agree. I'm not against Jewish identity. Everybody can identify himself as he wants. But let me identify myself as I want. The Jews, most of the Jews don't accept it. It's three days that I get and got letters after the publication of The Guardian, of a lot of Jews that blame me to be a critic. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to, to both uh, speakers and <clears throat> for this uh, uh, fascinating uh, a very lively discussion, uh, which is actually far beyond just the topic of, uh, of one religion, actually. It's a, we can extend the discussion to, uh, to, to all religions in some way and to religious identities and, uh, and the, the issue of identity beyond religion itself. So this is a very interesting uh, discussion. 